So Mic Mac Mail number 11, we've got, of course, a digital storage oscilloscope and something and something and something. So let's get into it. So, uh, before I start, I have to warn you, this video ended up being a very lengthy video. Before I knew it, I was actually reviewing far too many things. Uh, if you can stay with it, uh, you might find something out. So first one, coming from someone, I don't know who. Okay, Banggood. This is obviously something I've ordered. I have no idea what it is. So I had a quick look on the website. Um, this is actually a solar charger. So this is one of the ones I was going to look at for my mailbox project. It uh, can charge up to 200 milliamps. It's fairly similar to the DF Robot LiPo solar charger. Uh, but this one has USB out. That might be quite a good one. Let's try it out, eh? Okay, so I've got a uh, an old Nokia 1 amp hour battery. Uh, from an old Nokia phone. As far as I can see, uh, that's battery, uh, that's solar cell input, uh, that's also USB charging. If you want to chuck a, um, a USB connector onto it, you can charge the LiPo as well, uh, and that's the output. I've got my handy solar cell from my letterbox, uh, not using that anymore. It's always good practice to uh, cover up the solar cell before you connect up because the over voltage, uh, you could sort of get up to about uh, eight, nine, ten volts uh, on some of the solar cells. All right, so that's currently off. Let's turn it over, and that's on. Okay, so that's the the red LED is the indicator light, showing the the current charge, and apparently it turns green when it's fully charged. So it's a fairly decent little board. I'll need to run it overnight and see, sorry, not overnight, I'll need to run it uh, during the day to see if the uh, LiPo actually does charge up properly. Let's check this voltage out. Uh, so we should be getting five volts out on this. Nice, look at that, it's pretty good. Um, now I know that this LiPo isn't charged at all. Uh, so it's almost flat, which is not a good state to leave LiPos in. Uh, but still getting a, a 5 volts output on that, so that's pretty decent. I won't know how good it is until I actually chuck it out in the sun and see uh, what the charge is like over a full day. So the next one, uh, I think this one came from Tindy. Now I think it's soft. Hmm. So it's got a uh, t-shirt in it. So let me just be careful with this. So I've cut things before inside packets. Oh, excellent. My friend uh, over at friends over at Tindy uh, sent me a uh, care package. Nice Tindy logo, some stickers. Excellent. So if you don't know about Tindy, Tindy is a pretty good uh, store where makers can sell a lot of their products, um, and they they could be full fledged products all the way down to uh, just tiny little PCBs. So it's a really good uh, store, online store. It's sort of like a cross between um, Adafruit and SparkFun and some of the China shops. So it's just a big sort of marketplace where people can build whatever they want to build and uh, sell their stuff online. So it's nice. Uh, so thanks for that. I think it was Jasmine who sent me that. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, and a whole bunch of stickers. Excellent. Okay, so the next one. Uh, this one is yet another unknown package. I don't know where it's come from. Okay, Rack Wireless asked me if I wanted to beta test uh, the new WizCore. This is an Amazon Alexa based unit. The WizCore is comprised up of several components. Um, you've got the uh, sort of Wiz app, I think it's called, which they've had for a while, I believe. Uh, but then this is the daughter board, uh, which runs a MediaTek M2, sorry, MT7628. Uh, it's got a little Wi-Fi radio on board. Uh, there's a 580 megahertz MIPS CPU, so it's pretty speedy. Pretty sure that runs in, that just drops in there. Um, and then you've got the WizKey uh, board on top of that, and that just drops on top of that as well, I think. It all sort of fits in nicely. So um, this is aimed for people who want to use uh, Amazon Alexa, and it's quite a nice little unit. Of course, it all 
interface to an Arduino. We've got an Arduino here somewhere. Yep. You can actually interface it to an Arduino if you want to. But you've got a fairly speedy uh, CPU on board there. I probably won't have time to test this one out because it's still only in beta. But I might do a review on this one uh, at some stage. Of course, you get all the other bits and pieces, aerial, uh, antennas, everything else. Um, that's quite good. So stay tuned for a review on that one. Uh, thanks to Rack Wireless for that. So one of my subs helped me out with a digital storage oscilloscope. It's one bit of test equipment I didn't really have and I needed some sort of way of measuring analog signals and, and all that sort of stuff. Now this one isn't a particularly flash one but it's enough to complement my current test kit. So it's a simple two channel one. Let's crack it open. So this is a fairly um, simple one. It's a, it's an old based on an old Digitech QC1932 model. It's not an incredibly flash one. Uh, it's only 25 megahertz, 500 mega samples per second. It's got USB input. Um, so I believe there's some people have been reflashing them. RS232 device USB. Nice. Let's give this uh, a bit of a test out and see how it goes. Oh, that's a bit dodgy, isn't it? Ah, oh, it's a bit of sticky stuff left over. Probes, where are the probes? So let's um, fire up some test code on a bit of maybe an Arduino or a Teensy. Um, that might be fast enough and see how fast we can get to. So let's uh, first of all try a little pie out. Uh, see how fast we can get the pins toggling. Should be able to get a fair amount of speed out of it. But let's see. So I found this great bit of software which allows you to toggle the GPIO pins as fast as possible uh, using uh, DMA. So it's a fairly good bit of software. Uh, installing it's pretty easy, just fetch it, just pull it down, uh, unzip it. CD into the directory, it's a standard make file that uses, so just run make. Uh, there you go, you got the binary, uh, and it, you can run a number of DMA tests on it on GPIO pins. So I've plugged it into a GPIO th uh, 3. Now let's zoom in and uh, see what we can get out of it. Alright, so I'm going to try uh, this DMA test. Let's see what comes up with. Interesting. Seems to be a whole lot of noise. Let's just pull down. Oh man, it is having a lot of trouble keeping up with it. So this GPIO DMA test will essentially toggle the, the GPIO pin as fast as it possibly can. So it's a uh, Raspberry Pi 3, it's not overclocked. So that's interesting. Let's uh, scale it down a bit. So first I'm going to export GPIO pin 3. Uh, set up to an output and just run through a simple loop toggling the pin on and off. So that's a fairly expected uh, toggle rate. The uh, DMA GPIO test, it's got 500 mega samples per second but it's just not going to keep up with it. So it's a fairly limited DSO. I was going to call it Crow. It shows you my age, doesn't it? It's handy to have around when you want to check out some low frequency signals. So I loaded that very simple sketch onto this uh, 8 mega 3 u 4 now I think this is an 8 megahertz uh, CPU, it's been clocked at, so let's see how fast it is. So it's toggling that pin at roughly 70 kilohertz, which is pretty slow. Still a fair amount of, amount of space left in the uh, resolution, so let's see if we can find a CPU with just a slightly faster clock rate. So now I've got an Arduino Leonardo, which is being clocked at 16 megahertz, um, and you'll see that's pretty much double the, the speed. Okay, so we can uh, see those pulses. We're still a little bit left. There's about four ranges left uh, before you can't see it. So let's step it up a bit. Let's see if the DSO can keep up with the ITC bus on a plain old Arduino Leonardo. I'll whack on the uh, second probe just so we can get uh, two probes going. Uh, so you can see it's keeping up with the ITC bus fairly well. The resolution, that's 2.5 microseconds, one microsecond, 500 nanoseconds, 
250, 100, 50 nanoseconds. It's still fairly fast. Um, okay, let's see if I can step it up even further. So next I'm trying a TNZ 3.5, which has a top frequency of 120 megahertz. So the same simple code, toggling the GPO pin 2 uh, up and down. So let's see what it looks like. So this time you can see I'm down to 250 nanoseconds and we've got one, two, three more um, positions after that. So we need to speed it up even more. So the next test, I'm trying out the ILI 9163 um, LCD benchmark for the Teensy. Uh, I haven't connected a display up to it. It's just connected up to the SPI bus. Um, and you can see it's just barely coping. So this is a Teensy running at 120 megahertz and you're just barely seeing the signals. So essentially this Crow is pretty good for the majority of tests. Uh, but if you want anything fast, like fast SPI buses, any sort of fast signals, you're pretty much out of luck uh, with it, uh, unfortunately. But, you know, it's it's pretty good. Um, and I got it a, a bargain basement price from one of my subscribers. Uh, and it'll actually be fairly invaluable uh, to enhance my test kit. So one other thing I did was I checked uh, to see what sort of noise this particular DSO would uh, produce. So I followed that guide from EV blog uh, forum website and looks like it's a pretty low noise DSO, which is good. There's very little noise that's coming out of this. Uh, so that's quite good. That's actually a fairly decent DSO. So then I wanted to try out using EasyScope PC software. So the DSO actually comes with a CD, which is a modified version of EasyScope X that works specifically for this DSO. Uh, I ended up having this have not find any device error. So I installed the National Instruments Visa package, which, you know, take a look at this. This is a 640 meg zip download, which expands out to about a gig. I don't know why I need to install a gig worth of software just to access this DSO, but anyway. So it didn't work. So then I plugged it into a Linux box. I found out that the vendor ID was actually Atten Electronics or Sigland Technologies, which meant I could use Atten Load, possibly, to pull down some of the waveforms from the, the DSO. And then running it couldn't actually get any response out of it. So looking through the source code, I found the hard-coded in the Atom Load USB vendor ID is F4EC, but the product ID is slightly different, EE38. So a quick hack to modify that, uh, recompile it, and it was actually talking to it, but not really quite talking to it. I ended up getting no data out of it at all. So that's a possibility to get Atom Load going with this DSO and I'll have a look to see if I can actually get some sort of data off it, which would be nice to have. Um, and that's about it for this DSO. So while I got this crow out, I thought I'd try one of the things I bought from a previous mailbag, which is oh, going back to earlier, earlier in the year. Um, this was something I picked up from IC Station, I think it was, or Banggood. I'm sure I'll flash it up on the screen. This is a fairly standard buck converter, uh, but it has an onboard voltage display. Uh, so one of my subscribers mentioned that they had bought one of these and the voltage display really wasn't that good. So while I've got my crow out, uh, let's check it out and see what the voltage is like and what uh, noise we can see on the, uh, on the DC output. I've attached uh, my bench power supply to the input. I've set the bench power supply to around uh, 5 volts. So I'll set the output to about 3 volts. Uh, there needs to be a 1.5 volt difference between input and output. And we'll see how much the voltage varies based on how much I'm pushing into uh, the, the converter. So let's fire it up. Okay, so I've got um, about uh, 1 volt, 1.15 volts here. So let's just adjust it up. Okay, there's a bit of a delay in that. Whoa. Let's adjust up to 3.3 volts. As close as I can get to 3.3 volts. This is very hard to adjust. It's not as accurate as I was hoping. It needs to have a uh, finer grained um, trim pot on this thing because I'm finding that just the voltage is terrible. It just seems to be the closest I can get to it. Okay. 3.7. So you can see it's just really, really hard to adjust. 
Okay, that's the closest I can get to it. Got five volts coming in, 3.28 volts coming out. Um, so let's check to see what voltage we have on the on the output. So even though it says 3.27 volts, we're actually getting 3.55 volts. The voltage is actually inaccurate. Uh, and even look, 19.9 it says on the display, but it, I'm getting 20.4. Oh, I got the probe down the wrong way. I'm getting uh, 20.4, uh, so it's fa fairly inaccurate. So I don't know. Uh, if you want to have a, a DC supply that isn't accurate, go ahead and get one of these, um, or else get something that's a bit better. Now there's one more that's come in. Just then, uh, the doorbell rang and uh, this was delivered. I haven't even looked up to see what it is. Um, so let's find out. Okay, it's a bag. Excellent. Okay. Another bag. Excellent. I just like bags. And a box. And, ah, oh, fantastic. You do guys asked me if I wanted to review their x86 board. I said yes, certainly. Uh, and this is it. So, um, let me see if I've got a power supply. Oh, yeah, a uh, US power supply. Yeah, that's right. I can handle that. I've got adapters for it. What's in this bag? That's interesting. cut through it because it might actually be something sensitive. Oh, okay, fan, okay, that's good because I did actually ask for the official heatsink so I could test it out. Uh, excellent, I've got USB cables and an extra fan. Let's uh, crack it open, eh? So this was a Kickstarter that happened a while ago. Tell me what it was. So it's, it looks fairly decently well packed. It's quite good. So there we have it. The Udu X86. So the Udu X86 is one really nice board. Uh, it's uh, running a quad core N3160 CPU at uh, 2 gigs. Uh, 4 gigs DDR3 RAM. Uh, what else has it got? Uh, HDMI and 2 mini DPI. Gigabit Ethernet. Uh, all the USB ports are 3.0. There's uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, there's also a SATA chip, there's a SATA controller. And on the flip side, we've got two M2 slots. This is a SATA uh, port you've got. SD slot, real-time clock, DC barrel jack power in, which is really useful. Um, and you've also got an Intel Curie. So this provides up to 28 GPIOs. You've got a standard Arduino compatible GPIO header block. This this has absolutely everything on it. There's also a Realtek audio chip, so you've got uh, audio out and you've got a headphone jack. Besides the Intel Curie, there's also an uh, STM32 uh, chip on there, on the back. So it'll be interesting to see how this actually performs. The good thing is, um, running with 4 gigs, I'll be able to run a lot of different operating systems on it, so I wouldn't mind trying a couple of ones that are theoretically unsupported. So that's the Udo X86, which will be a nice one to, to look at. So this week's haul is quite a decent one. Thanks uh, for Tindy for giving me the t-shirts the and the stickers, that's nice. Um, got the Wizcore. Uh, this one was from a previous Mick Make Mail episode, uh, so I tested that one out. Uh, the Udo X86, thanks guys for seeing that one along. Um, and thanks to uh, my subscriber, you know who you are, uh, for helping me out with uh, the purchase of this particular DSO. Anyway, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching and see you next week.